Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Moving on to another fatal shooting of a black man at the hands of police in these United States of America. The latest incident happened in Chicago on March 21st, following a traffic stop that ended in the death of 26-year-old Dexter Reed. According to an oversight committee of Chicago's police department, five officers assigned to a tactical unit pulled Reed over for purportedly not wearing a seatbelt. As the group stopped Reed, multiple officers surrounded his car and repeatedly asked him to roll his windows down. Officers then shouted at Reed not to roll the windows up and to unlock his doors. As the shouts from police grew louder, gunfire began. Take a look and be caution. Viewer discretion is advised. Roll the window down. Put your window down, man. Roll the window down. What are you doing? What are you doing? Hey, roll this one down, too. Roll that one down, too. Hey, don't roll the window up. Oh, don't roll the window up. Hey, okay. Do not roll the window up. Do not fucking roll it up. Unlock the doors now. Unlock the fucking door. Unlock the doors now. Unlock the fucking door. Unlock the doors now. Unlock the fucking door. Unlock the door. Unlock the door. Open the, door now. Open the door now! Open the door now! Open the door now! Ninety-six shots were fired. Ninety-six over 41 seconds. Yesterday, the Chicago Civilian Officer, Office, I'm sorry, of Police Accountability, or COPA, released the body cam video you're watching of the incident. And in a statement, COPA said preliminary evidence, quote, appears to confirm, end quote, that Reed fired first, shooting an officer in the arm before officers responded by firing those 96 shots into his car. The agency recommended four of the officers involved be relieved of their police powers during the investigation. Reed's family and attorneys questioned why plainclothed officers swarmed Reed's car with guns drawn in the first place. It's appropriate to say this, another shooting has occurred no one's calling it murder. Some may think that it is the case, but that's not what people are saying right now. There's two sides to this story. One is that a shot was fired at a police officer first, to which there appears to be no dispute. The other part is 96 shots over 41 seconds. That doesn't even begin to touch on a level of excessiveness that we most of us would deem unnecessary. But I'm gonna leave my opinions at the door from that point forward because I rely on the thoughts of my next guest. Joining me now to discuss the facts of the case is Andrea Kirsten, who currently leads Chicago's Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, as they say, as its chief administrator. Andrea, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Before we get into the facts of the case, please explain to my audience COPA's role in the city of Chicago. Sure, and thank you for having me. Um, so COPA is a city of Chicago agency. We are about 150 employees that are all civilians, and we're tasked with investigating allegations of police misconduct uh, when they are alleged to have been committed by members of the Chicago Police Department. Um, something that is really important to understand is we are also tasked with investigating every police shooting. So anytime a Chicago Police Department member uh, discharges their, their firearm uh, at a person, we are obligated to investigate those incidences. And that is what prompted our our inquiry into the death of Dexter Reed Jr. on March 21st of this year. <laughs> Who's the organization specifically accountable to? 
Um, so I'm a city, I, I'm a city official. I lead an organization that's a city entity, but I also have oversight. So mm. there's a commission here in Chicago, the Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability. They have oversight over the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department and uh, the chief administrator, which is my position of COPA. Uh, we also have an, a, a city inspector general who's always allowed to weigh in on the efficacy of any city agency and the way that we do our work. Um, and then as a transparent entity um, and, and government agency, we're accountable to the public. Uh, so there's a lot of the work that we do, and this is evidenced by the release of these videos yesterday, um, the work that we do and, and the results ultimately of all of our investigations become public information. And so the court of public opinion also gets to weigh in on the role that we play in the work that we do. Some people would interpret that as being an organization that essentially is tantamount out to being a police internal affairs organization. Is that an accurate depiction of the of COPER or, or would you say otherwise? No, it's in fact the exact opposite. So mm. we are singular in the country in that we are completely separate from and outside of the Chicago Police Department as a civilian oversight agency that has the authority that we have. Um, the, the Chicago Police Department has a Bureau of Internal Affairs. They have sort of separate jurisdiction. But any time in the city of Chicago, a member of the public makes a complaint for excessive force, for improper search or seizure, so your Fourth Amendment violations, uh, for coercion, for unlawful denial of right to counsel. Anytime there's an allegation, a Chicago Police Department member committed sexual misconduct or domestic violence. And as I mentioned, any officer involved shooting, any police in shooting or death in custody, those are all COPA's jurisdiction. So, and again, we are not employees of the city of Chicago's police department. We are not sworn law enforcement. We're civilians who are trained subject matter experts familiar with the department, the police department's training and procedures and what the rules are that govern their conduct, but we're evaluating that conduct from the lens of a civilian oversight entity. And that's a really critical difference between us and an internal affairs division. Getting into the specifics of this case, this investigation is taking place. The footage was released yesterday, as you um, accurately uh, uh, stated. It seems to be to have been expedited. Usually it would take longer for video to be released, according to my research. Is it fair to say that the process was expedited and it happened a bit quicker than we than we expected? And if that is if that, if that if there's a yes to that question, why so? Well, actually, it's it's kind of a no to that question okay. here in Chicago. We've had video release transparency requirements at the Civilian Office of Police Accountability since 2016. And mm. that was really in response uh, to the murder of Chicago teen Laquan McDonald uh, by an on-duty Chicago police officer. And the lack of transparency around those videos mm prompted the changes that led to these requirements. So since 2016, uh, we have had 60 days approximately to release video footage in all police shootings. Again, not picking or choosing which shootings uh, there may or may not be a problem in, but releasing footage in all shootings mm. every time. Um, but our practice for the last several years has really been at COPA, 60 days uh, is probably too long wow. to hold on to a lot of this information. So in many fatal shootings, we're able to get that footage out sooner. Um, unfortunately, people know Chicago um, for the fatal shooting of Adam Toledo, uh, a young man 13 years of age uh, killed by Chicago police. That footage released by my agency was released in 17 days. So this is not necessarily um, a different timeline. It's just when it's getting the attention that it gets, it gives us an opportunity to kind of contextualize all that's occurring. Is this being investigated and is the probe continuing because this 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 26 year old Dexter Reed uh, was killed uh, and primarily that's it? Or is it because of those 96 shots in 41 seconds? I would imagine the latter is just as significant as the fatality of the situation. So what's important is, as I mentioned, every police shooting gets this level of scrutiny. Okay. Um, and when we investigate a police shooting, the use of deadly force is, is one of the highest responsibilities that we entrust our law enforcement with. Like they have the right to use deadly force against the public. So when that when that force is used, they are subjected to an immense amount of scrutiny for how that's how that's effectuated. And every time that we conduct these investigations, we are looking at what we call the totality of circumstances. And in this case and in any other, those those circumstances include all of the actions of both, you know, the, the individual in the community here, Dexter Reed Jr., and the officers leading up to the use of deadly force. So for this incident, that starts from the moment that vehicle is curbed and the reasons behind that 
all of these things become relevant factors. It's not as simple as, as saying, you know, we can determine that Dexter Reed shot first and officers returned fire, uh, end of story. We are looking at the totality of circumstances because that's what's required under CPD's policy and training. In the totality of these circumstances, what would enter the mind of, dare I say, a quote unquote cynic towards the police department is, why did you pull him over in the first place? Really, that many officers needed to approach him because he wasn't wearing a seat belt. To those that would make such an argument against the police, what would you say in that regard? Uh, you know, I think how police use their resources are really critical aspects of what police reform looks like. I think there are things we all agree on. Everyone wants safe communities. Everyone understands that police play a role in, in making our communities safer, but how that work is done, how different communities experience policing, all of those things are on the table for relevant parts of this conversation. And, and I think that, you know, no one wants to see this outcome, whether you work for the police department, you're a community member, or God forbid, a family member of someone who, who loses a loved one in this way. No one would look at this situation and say this is an optimal outcome. Um, so instead, we have to start asking ourselves, how did, how did this situation arise in the first place? And what can we do differently? And that's really what, you know, evaluating these cases, that's, that's what the conversation has to be about. The reason I ask that question is because uh, Mr. Strauss, the attorney for the family, uh, called the stop an unconstitutional police stop with plainclothes officers who did not announce they were police. Uh, is, does COPER find itself agreeing with that assessment by the family attorney? Does it refute that? What's the position on what the family attorney is proclaiming? So my position on it, number one, is our investigation is still ongoing. And that's an important distinction. Like a transparency video release isn't about conclusions. That's about making information publicly available. But our investigation is still ongoing. But as I mentioned, it starts from that first encounter. So we have to evaluate whether that stop was proper, whether it was constitutional. And then as we move through the totality of circumstances, the use of force under CPD policy has to be objectively reasonable, necessary, and proportional. That's the language from their policy. That's how they're trained. And officers are also required to prioritize the sanctity of life, and that includes all lives, officers and members of the public, above all else. So those are some of the, the things that we have to weigh in light of those totality of circumstances to see whether officers, in fact, acted in compliance with their policy. Again, not certainly not trying to come across as a cynic in this particular situation. The matter is serious and deserves to be treated with the seriousness that it deserves. But when, he, when you bring up the, the, the point of, officers needing to prioritize life and, and safety when you shoot at an individual 96 times in 41 seconds, I think it, we can easily surmise that, you know, preserving life would, didn't, didn't appear to be a priority in this particular situation. Is that, is that not fair to say? I have to wait until our investigation is concluded, but I raise the language and the policy just to level set the understanding that these are the issues that we will be examining. And this is what can be expected uh, when we do reach our final conclusions, which of course will ultimately be made public as well. What role, I mean, a cop being shot is a very, very significant thing. You'd have people in this country say, that's all you need to see. The minute an officer is shot, all bets are off and they stop right there. I know you're saying COPA can't possibly be that way. That's not what your organization is about. Out, and I totally, I totally respect that. My question, however, would be, considering the fact that the officer got shot first, what role does that play in determining the level of culpability officers have in such a situation because the initial situation involved an officer getting shot? So it's a significant factor. And when we talk about the totality of circumstances, the actions officers took leading up to that use of force and the actions Dexter Reed Jr. took leading up to that use of force are all on the table and have to be considered. So we certainly have to reconcile that. That is one of the most pivotal aspects of, of this investigation, quite frankly. But historically, when we have talked about police shootings, a factor like that would be the only factor that is discussed. And, and to your point, I think there is still discourse around that being the only factor factor that needs to be examined. Uh, when reform-minded policies like we have in place here in Chicago, 
require otherwise. So they require this, this review to include all of the tactical choices and all of the other decision making and whether or not de-escalation was available or utilized in this incident. Those aren't optional things. Those are mandatory requirements of these officers. And so those are things that we have to consider as well. It's, it's not a binary one or the other outcome. Mm -hmm. It really, when I say totality of the circumstances, it means examining all facts um, on both sides of this issue, which is complicated. What, what, what literal, reasonable type of ramifications can these officers face in this situation, considering the fact, considering the, the, the reports, rather, that they were shot at first? What kind of ramifications could they potentially be facing? Because I know the family is calling for the officer's dismissal, but I didn't hear anybody coming out calling for them to be arrested, indicted, and ultimately incarcerated. Well, and it's, uh, this is important. So when my agency does its work, we're an administrative uh, investigatory body. So we are conducting basically a review of whether department policies were followed. And the most uh, that we are authorized to make recommendations on would be whether an officer, you know, in a more low level incident needs to be retrained, possibly suspended. The ultimate and most severe consequence or disciplinary outcome that COPA could recommend would be termination from the Chicago Police Department. However, many of our investigations, and I'm not talking solely about this, this incident, but have the potential for criminal review. So we have to work closely with law enforcement partners, such as the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. And in all police shootings, every single police shooting, whether or not we think uh, there is necessarily a problem in, with the outcome, all of those materials are referred to the, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office so that that criminal review can happen. And that has certainly occurred in this case in the aftermath of the shooting. We briefed the State's Attorney, the FBI, and the Department of Justice, as we do in all all police shootings, because I can't stress this enough. A use of deadly force uh, by a state actor like this is one of the most serious consequences that can occur. And while that force can be lawful and justified and is in the majority of these instances, we want to make sure that each and every one of these is thoroughly vetted and that that criminal review happens by the entities authorized to make those decisions. So we cooperate with that, but those decisions are outside of COPA's individual purview. Getting a bit personal for a second, because obviously from an administrative standpoint, COPA's doing great work. Thank you. By the way, thank you so much for the work that you are doing. Uh, have you met with the family at all? Uh, yes, and I, I think... That is perhaps the most important question um, when you're talking about transparency around these things. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about sort of the timeline for release and did this come out sooner or later. Something that the public needs to understand is that COPA does not release these videos to the public without working with the family first. Um, so families can make themselves uh, as involved or not involved with the release as they, as they want. But we give families the opportunity to come into our office to view what is often horrific you know, footage for them prior to our release to the public. And that's a really critical part of our work. We would not be putting this information out to the public um, until a family has had that opportunity. And certainly that's an opportunity that Dexter Reed's family took. Um, and while we can't ever in any of these situations ensure outcomes for, for families, that's not what our role is. We have to be balanced and we have to be objective, but we can make sure they understand the process and that they can expect communication and transparency from us as an agency. And, and that is what we did in this case and what we do in all of our cases. Mayor Brandon Johnson was on the record saying, quote, attempts to withhold or delay information are mistakes of the past. Is that true? Are they mistakes of the past or are they mistakes of the current? I mean, I can say that Chicago is unique in the country with respect to transparency, particularly around police shootings. We learned hard lessons from the murder of Laquan McDonald and the lack of that transparency. And so we really don't have a situation where the public does anything here locally, the public does anything here, but wait and expect and trust that COPA is going to release these videos. And we don't pick and choose. We're not, you know, we're not editorializing which videos come out. We're not saying, oh, this is a bad incident. We're going to release these. No, every use of deadly force, uh, every police shooting incident, we release videos and we release all of them. Uh, we're not picking and choosing because this isn't about narrative and it's not about conclusion. Uh, transparency works best when it's consistent and it's complete. And so that's really what our approach has been. And so there's a lot of reform work left in Chicago as there is across the country when it comes to policing. But on, on the point of transparency, I'm proud to lead an agency um, that, that really does this differently and a city whose government supports that work. 
Civilian Office of Police Accountability created in 2016 after the city was forced to release dash cam video of then officer Jason Van Dyke shooting the 17 year old Laquan McDonald, which is what you've been alluding to, which is why I wanted to say that to the audience. Having said everything that you've just said, moving forward, let's let's talk about this for a quick second before I let you get on out of here. Thank you so much again for your time. Chicago data on police shootings and injuries. I looked this up. University of Illinois, Chicago Law Enforcement Epidemiology Project. 10 people, approximately 10 people killed by law enforcement each year. 200 people are treated in hospitals each year for injuries caused by law enforcement. 500 million has been paid by the city of Chicago during the past 10 years to settle civil suits for police misconduct and civil rights violations. As somebody working with an overseer COPA right now, how are you feeling about the progress that the city of Chicago has made over the last few years? I know you just alluded to the transparency, but ultimately, as you well know better than most, it comes down to results. How are you feeling about the results that have transpired since COPA's existence several years ago? I think we have one of the most robust sort of oversight and accountability systems in place. And I've, I've talked a lot about Chicago Police Department policies. They are some of the most reform minded policies. Um, and now, so I, I like to say the table is set for, for the meaningful work of reform to actually sort of take root. Um, but what is, what is going to be required are cultural changes within an almost 200 year old institution of the Chicago Police Department. And so that, that work is ongoing, but having the ability to be transparent about what goes wrong and when it does and how we address those issues, that is a critical part uh, in ensuring that reform continues to advance and to progress. Anything additional that you can tell us about your engagement with the Reed family? Anything else that's developed from that? You know, there isn't a family that we meet with that it, it's, it changes you in order to have that that kind of that opportunity. Um, it's a privilege to get to do the work that we do um, and, and to do so knowing that we, we don't always deliver results that individuals want, but but hoping that we can engender trust in the process. Um, this family, like so many families, they have a lot of strength and courage behind them um, about what they're facing and what they're dealing with. Uh, but there, there is just no one that wants to find themselves in this situation. And that, that includes officers. You know, you had an officer injured in this incident as well, and no one wants to be uh, in this scenario. But when these things happen, um, I think in Chicago, we're fortunate to, to be able to lead in the space of, of trying to at least shine a light on this so that there may be a path forward to try to prevent uh, the next fatal shooting from occurring. Well, thank God for you and thank God for COPA and the work that you're doing. But I will tell you this, the police department, just reading up additionally on the my notes, has been under a consent decree since 2019, handed down after the U.S. Justice Department found a long history of racial bias and excessive use of force following McDonald's death back, obviously, in 2016. I'll close by asking you this question. One of the most alarming things that I've ever seen in my adult life was when I saw, I was watching television, and I saw an elder African-American couple on national television from Chicago begging and imploring our federal government to send the National Guard to Chicago because they were that fearful of things that was happening in the streets of Chicago. In your estimation, have things improved tremendously or incrementally since 2016? You know, with respect to the police department itself, I, I think there is definitely change, um, but I think that the arc of reform is going to be a long one. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a 200 year old department and the, the entrenched practices and the problems identified in the Department of Justice report and the ways in which the, the federal consent decree and its many requirements seek to address those, it's going to take time um, for that to really change the way people feel their lives are impacted by policing on the street. So that, that work is ongoing, but we are, we are here to stay the course. Andrea Kirsten. Thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate the insight, the education, the information. Thank you so much. And please, please, please continue to do the great work that you're doing for the city of Chicago. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks again to Andre, Andrea Kirsten, uh, the leader for the Civil Office of Police Accountability, also known as COPER, in the city of Chicago. I appreciate her enlightening all of us. And we recognize how alarming this situation is. The facts are still for the most part unknown, the investigation as she articulated is still ongoing 
And in the days and weeks to come, as we continue to find out more and more additional information, we'll be able to surmise what level of ramification should be necessary when it comes to those police officers who shot and killed Dexter Reed by spraying his car with 96 bullets spanning 41 seconds. We all should keep our eyes on this particular story and most importantly to the city of Chicago to see how effective COPA is. So maybe, just maybe, that's an organization that should exist in all of our cities throughout the United States of America as opposed to just the city of Chicago. Keep in mind that just today, six former Mississippi law enforcement officers were sentenced to decades in prison just today in state court. They had already been convicted in federal court, but today it was in state court. Six officers, who am I talking about? I'm talking about that goon squad in Mississippi who were convicted of torturing two black men. Remember that? Well, once again, we've got a situation that involves police officers, and in this particular situation in Chicago, a death, as opposed to torture, where two individuals in Mississippi still remain alive. Nevertheless, it's all incredibly harmful. It's all very, very disturbing. And it's all stuff that we can't run away from because you can't make society a better place by sweeping stuff under the rug and never addressing things with the fervor, the tenacity, and the spirit and soul that it deserves. Thanks again, Andrea Kirsten, for the work that she is doing in the city of Chicago, that COPA is doing in the city of Chicago. And we just hope that it touches all of our conscience to make sure it enlightens us and makes us even more aware of the kind of transgressions that are taking place throughout our society. That's how we get better. We don't run from problems. We address them. We conquer. We overcome. It starts with paying attention, being interested, and not running from the challenge of shining a light on issues that need to have a light shown on it.